everybody, Brad the Guitologist here. In today's video, we're going to look at a really cool, very special amplifier. This is a 1967 JTM50 Plexi head, uh, and this is also known as the Black Flag because of that little JTM right there. The JTM 45s, well, all of the JTM 45s pretty much up to this point practically had MK2 or Mark II over here and then they also had uh, they had JTM 45 written over here on this side this one has uh, no JTM 45 over here because they changed the name to a JT M50 after changing the transformer and also they added this little black flag logo they only made this style of faceplate for about a year or so uh, so this is a pretty rare amplifier. The customer said he found this thing in Hawaii of all places and had it shipped to him. So we're going to try to find out a little bit more about the history of this particular amplifier. Hawaii is a really weird place to find a Marshall. So, you know, there's a chance there that uh, this was probably left on the island by some touring musician at some point who sold the amplifier rather than, you know, paying to ship it with him. Uh, back to wherever he was going after Hawaii. So really interesting amplifier with a potentially interesting history. And if that sounds like something you'd be interested in yourself, please stick around. Okay, just going over the controls on this thing, you can see that there are four inputs and there are also two channels. Uh, this particular example is missing a couple of knobs. There's one missing there. There's one missing a little further down over here. We have treble, middle, and bass, and also presence. Uh, indicator light, which in this case is square and could be could have been changed possibly. I'm not sure. Spent standby switch and on off switch. Let's go ahead and flip it around and get a look at the rear. Okay, so here's the rear of the amplifier. Uh, you can see we have three preamp tubes, uh, two output tubes, and also we have a rectifier tube, uh, which is one of the features of early Marshalls. And here we have a, a single uh, capacitor can which we may or may not have to replace it looks like this one may have already been replaced by someone so possible that could have been already taken care of for us the customer says that this thing is not coming on he gets no tube glow and it's just completely dead that can either be a good thing uh, or it could be a bad thing it could be something as simple as a switch and it could be something as bad as a bad power transformer which would be really not too good um, so we're crossing our fingers and hoping it's not that power transformer uh, you can see here, this has the old style uh, mains connector still attached, and we do have that, which is good, because that would probably be somewhat hard to find, I would imagine now. We have a couple of fuses, a mains fuse and a high tension fuse. The high tension fuse indicates it's supposed to be one amp. We have the kind of the older style Marshall selectors here on the back panel. Some of these older Marshalls had the selectors up on the transformers themselves uh, but on this one it has been moved down here to the rear panel uh, we have a couple of speaker outs right there and we do have a serial number on this one so if you're the type of person who keeps count and wants to uh, com maybe compare this to your old shipping notes from the 1960s <laughs> there's the serial number if you know anything about this particular uh, example uh, please do let me know the preamp tubes are Brimar labeled and well at least all but this first one this first one is a 7025 uh, Sovtech so it's interesting that they've got a 7025 Sovtech over here in this position but they've got these older made in England Brimars in the second and third position where they're a little further down the line I think that CA right there might be a year or the BVA I'm not sure which might be a year on this tube but you see see there Brimar ECC 83 Okay, a little backstory on Brymar. Uh, Brymar itself, the name, is short for British Made American Range. The codes read as follows. The first number right there is the week of the production. The second number, which is a letter, is the month of production. In this case, that stands for January. So you'll see there the second week in January. The third one is the year, so that's a number one. That either stands for 1961 or 1971. And everything after that, the uh, 2162 in this case is the type of tube, which is, is an ECC 83. And based on the limited research I've done into Brimar tubes and their various logos and labels throughout the years, I think this is probably a 1961 tube. 
An interesting bit of history I came across while researching this video. That BVA on that tube right there stands for British Valve Association, which according to sources I'll cite in the video description was established in 1926 and represented, quote, a cartel of the seven major valve manufacturers in the UK that was supposedly chartered to protect the interests of the UK valve industry from foreign competition, unquote. But in reality, the BVA was engaged in concerted protectionism and price fixing on all tubes sold inside Great Britain. They did this to prevent a flood of cheaper tubes from American and other European manufacturers entering the British market. Most BVA members were also manufacturers of the equipment their tubes went into, such as TVs and radios, further entrenching them into monopolistic practice territory. In fact, Brymar itself, who was owned by a partnership between two other companies, Thorne and AEI, had several factories that made both valves and TV and radio equipment. All of this anti-competitive activity is considered illegal today in Britain. Now on to the output tubes, and these are some pretty old Genelex Gold Lion labeled KT77s made by Marconi Osram Valve Company, a subsidiary of the British General Electric Company, which bears no relation to the American company of the same name. The KT77 is an EL34 equivalent and was a brand new tube in the mid-1960s. You can see why these would be called the Gold Lion. I'm not sure exactly how to date these tubes, but I think the numbers on them are 7917, which I've seen on a lot of other KT-77s for sale. So maybe it's a military des designation of some kind. I'm not sure. That Z that you can see on there is for the Hammersmith factory, which is just outside of London. I do know these fetch a ton of money now, uh, and they are very rare. Genelex closed their factories and stopped making tubes in the late 70s or early 80s. But yeah, so the first things first, we're, we're going to uh, pull the chassis on this. We're going to hook it up to a, a very small voltage on the Variac on the primary and see if we get anything out of the secondary on the power transformer on the various windings. And that should at least give us some sort of indication on what's going on and what might be our, uh, our problem. I want to see if there's continuity through the switch and that sort of thing. So, so yeah, let's go ahead and pull the chassis and do some diagnosis on this. Let's take a look at the top of this chassis before we do anything else. And here we got a, what is that, a 352-114. These transformers were all made by Drake and they have original Drake part numbers on them, including the power transformer, which I didn't show. Classic Tone Transformers announced in 2020 they're going out of business, but it's possible you can still find exact replicas of these classic transformers for the time being while supplies last. So it looks like all three of those are probably original. Over here, I do see the remnants of the inspection tag. I don't see any uh, information that I can glean off of anything left there, but you can see where the tag used to be at one time. And on the side of the chassis over here, sometimes where they put the tag, there's nothing, so, and there's nothing on the other side either. So let's go ahead and flip it over. Okay, so here's the exciting bit. We are inside of this. 1967 Marshall amplifier here and uh, these electrolytics have been replaced over here this one has certainly been replaced and that one has been replaced as well um, not what I would expect to see from this era so those are probably okay but it's also you know automatically suspect whenever someone else has already had their hands in something so We'll go over all the solder joints and also we'll trace out everything to make sure that they did everything right there. Uh, of course, we have to inspect the plug. We also have to inspect the cable itself. If it's if, if nothing is happening and no tubes are lighting up at all, um, it could be anything really in the power section. Uh, we have some new electrolytic caps, but you can see right here, you know, when they were using this um, uh, sort of perforated phenolic board to mount everything on these turrets down here this was the construction method that Marshall was using at this time we do have a couple of new resistors right there also there's a new resistor right there which is probably I'm, I'm guessing it's 
that's for bias probably and uh, those couple of capacitors right there are probably also on the bias circuit I believe on this amp uh, another capacitor here and a resistor that's a couple of resistors that have likely been replaced um, and those caps were replaced also by the way uh, we have all the original uh, mustard capacitors all these coupling caps people call mustard caps usually um, those are all still in here and all accounted for and present and original by the look of it mostly a, a, an original example we do have a change right here of a resistor on this uh, I'm guessing that is a feedback resistor that must be what that is a feedback resistor because yeah, it's because it's being it's tapped off of the output, so that's probably a feedback resistor. I'm not sure why they would replace that unless there was some problem with that with the other feedback resistor originally. Let's look up the uh, the power and a load, and we'll check it out. Okay, so I'll be using a dummy load here on this one, and I've got it already set. This is actually an adjustable resistor. It goes up to 150 ohms from 0 to 150 and you slide this little bar uh, across to get the uh, actual resistance that is desired. And right now it's, well this is set on about 16 ohms, this resistor. Um, so we'll just change it back here to match. I'll make sure it's set to 16 back here and then we'll uh, try to fire it up and see what it's, see what it's doing. And if you use a dummy load like this, and you just use it out on the desk like I am, just be aware that they get hot, so you don't want to catch anything on fire. If you if you start pushing a bunch of uh, juice through it, uh, they'll get hot. All right, so we're gonna flip the switches to on, and we'll start the variac at zero. First of all, let's just put a couple of volts through. We'll go up to about 10 volts. All right, so we're at 10 volts right there. Actually, you know what? Before we do that, let's turn this back off. And first thing I want to do is check these uh, fuses. I just want to check across these for uh, continuity. And we have continuity on that fuse. And we've got 8 ohms on that fuse. Well, it's showing continuous, but I'm not... Not sure I trust that. What's going on there? Well, that's twisting. Look at that. Usually, fuse holders aren't supposed to twist when you try to take the fuse out. So, okay, that fuse looks good. It, it it's a three amp. It's supposed to be a one amp. That's supposed to be a one amp fuse, and they've got a three amp fuse. So I would say it was probably blowing fuses at some point. Uh, we'll have to change that with correct value fuse. Okay, you can see this. You can see this ohms reading right here kind of jumping around and I, I, I'm testing the cord so I've got my leads hooked up to the cord so I'm this is a way of uh, quickly and easily testing whether the cord is okay and the primary of the transformer is okay I have the switch set to on if I turn it off it goes to open lead so the switch at least seems to be good okay so it's doing its job but you'll notice I keep getting different readings over here and that's because look if I twist this socket, this power socket, even just a little bit, it just kind of jumps all over the place. That's because it's not getting really good contact on these contacts. So I don't know, that could be part of the issue. I mean, this is like a, this is not, it doesn't seem very secure to me the way that they have engineered this. It's just, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't seem to have a way to kind of spread out and then grab a hold of things. The contacts just seem like maybe they're worn out. So I don't know. I might be able to spray this and clean it and improve it because, I mean, that would definitely um, cause a problem if it wasn't getting good connection on the power cord. And also that would make a lot of sense in terms of uh, the symptoms that the amp was displaying. So... Okay, so it's still, it's just, it just feels loose in there. So I'm, I'm gonna see if there's a way I can maybe tension that. 
Yeah, there's there's no way to really retension this. It's just gonna have to be. I can spray it. Maybe clean off these pins slightly, but. Okay, that's brought the resistance down from, you know, a couple hundred ohms to about 30 ohms. Okay, so at least that's gotten the resistance way down. It's not nearly as high as it was, and it seems to be jumping around a little bit less whenever I move the plug. But, I mean, it is still jumping around some, like it's getting slightly intermittent connect connection on that. I may ask him what he wants to do with that. I mean, it probably would work as it is, but you might, I mean, to be reliable, you might want to put a little piece of tape or something over this just to hold it kind of in place. If the amp is, you know, on and sitting on top of a 412 cabinet or something like that, you know, this could vibrate to the point where, you know, this kind of vibrates intermittent. See what I'm saying? Like, so if the amp is on and vibrating like this, the that plug doesn't seem very secure. It's possible I might still be able to get this socket and plug and replace that. I'll have to look and see if um, I can find a place that carries that. Like I said, I'm not used to uh, repairing Marshalls and, and finding parts like that, so I'll have to I'll have to see on that. So we'll we'll set that to the side for a moment. But what I want to see now is um, whether or not. Uh, we're actually getting anything to the secondary of the transformer. So let's go ahead and plug it into the variac, and we're just going to put very minimal voltage on this thing. So we'll set our meter to volts AC, and we'll, like I said, we'll put just minimal voltage on this. All right, there's 15 volts. helps if we put the on switch on um, what am I missing here I think uh, maybe I've got those taps up oh I do don't I I think I've got those taps wrong let's just do it off this let's do it on the we'll do it here and see if we get our 15 volts okay so we got our 15 volts or so right there at that socket um, we've got a yellow wire coming off of here and I think it's it's tied to here so uh, I believe the black wire and the yellow these two so we got 27 volts AC right there Twenty-seven and a half volts AC right there. One point eight volts right there. Okay, so we still got about fifteen volts on the input, um, and like I said, there's a yellow wire that runs from here on the uh, fuse over to here. So that's one side of the transformer, and we've got a black wire that runs from over here, I think, to there. So this is what we're getting at this point. We're getting 27 volts AC right there, which is odd that that would be stepped up at all. I'm not, I'm not sure that can't be right. Then it's probably not the tap that I think it is. Well, let's see. We know that one side is the switch, right? So if we know that much, we can put it on the switch and then on this, right? There we go. There's our 15 volts right there. So. We know that uh, we're at least getting it to there. Now we need to we need to know what's going on on the secondary. I'm not sure what these colors represent, so we'll have to basically uh, uh, come off the rectifier. The rectifier is buried kind of down here, so um, it's kind of hard to get to. So what I might want to do, what do we got right here? These two yellow wires. We should have some kind of voltage right here something it's probably filaments right there I would imagine there we go we got 47 volts on the secondary right there 37 47 whatever 47 there as well so this will probably be what 94 yep so there is our there's our mains right there this will be the filament right here uh, well we have a 5 volt filament for the rectifier 
we should also have a 5 volt 5 volt for the rectifier now where would that be where are these yellow wires even going okay these yellow wires are going over there so that might be the 5 volt I'll spare you from watching me flail around here for a minute or so while I uh, find the 6.3 volt filament wires but they're actually down there on the bottom you see the two blue wires coming from the light uh, those are going into the transformer right there that's the 6.3 volt filament uh, for some reason, I was thinking that that light was was going to be the uh, the 120 AC version, but it's not. The tap in the center there is the center tap. We're getting voltage on the secondary. I'm going to hook up some probes to the output and just see if we're uh, getting any noise at all. All right, we've got it hooked up to the output here, and we're getting a signal at the output. I'm going to dial it up a little bit more on the variac. It's... Okay, now it's starting to come up. Now, there we go. Now we're getting something more significant. Okay, now they're start the tubes are definitely conducting. Look, somebody's home for sure. We just had too low of a voltage. Right now, we're only at 57 volts. I mean, there's no doubt that this thing is work operating. See right here, we've got an indicator light. We've got lots of signal coming out. Okay. This is me messing with the loudness control. You see our little notch of distortion right there. That's with the uh, loudness pretty much all the way up on that channel, channel one. So that's working. And then we got nothing all the way down. So that's a good looking sweep right there. It's pretty, pretty good looking. Now we've got no treble in this signal. So there's treble. And that's working. Uh, middle is working. Base appears to be working. Presence, yep. I set everything to the middle here. I want to see what. Yeah, see, so you get you get a lot of distortion when you start to mix in more treble with that loudness all the way up. And that would probably get even more significant as I dial up the juice here. So 77 volts on the input now, and you can see it's, I'm having to. Change my scope. See right there, all this this notch distortion that's going on, where it just crosses over. Boom, right there. That's all that gooey, distorted goodness, and then I can mix in some treble here, and that distorts the wave even further. That's that's sweeping through the treble. Okay, here's the middle. That's, that's base all the way down. Here is base all the way up. So it's definitely working. And then here's everything kind of in the middle, straight up and down on the controls. And we've got just a beautiful looking wave there. I mean, I don't see any problems with this the way it is right now. And I asked him, I said, okay, so you bought this thing from Hawaii. Did you have it shipped via plane or did it come via ocean carrier? Because if it came via ship, um, it could be that this thing was exposed to some salt water. But no, he said it came by air. It just wasn't getting a very good connection. But right now, like I said, the electrolytics have been replaced. So we know that those are good. I'll, I'll make sure that those are in there properly before we send this thing back. But... For right now, it's looking like at least this thing is healthy. Let's try channel two. The pot's dirty. You can see there. See how it warbles as I turn it. That's that pot's dirty. So I definitely need to clean pots and just just for standard things like that. Lubricate the pots. 
Yeah, dude, I don't see um, I don't see any real cause for concern, at least not here at 77 volts. I'm not going to. Uh, well, let's go ahead and dial it on up. We may as well see where we're at, see what kind of wattage we're drawing also. Okay, we're at 100 volts right there. I mean, that wave is looking really good to me. See, these volume controls are interactive on these channels as well. They will affect one another just because of the way the circuit is designed. Okay, uh, yeah, I mean, so far this thing is not displaying the symptoms that the customer said uh, he was experiencing. So um, I think this is going to be a matter of probably just at this point checking the bias, just doing some standard rout routine things uh, like cleaning pots. So I spoke to the customer at this point about what the amp was doing and the cause of the no power situation. And I explained that the old Bulgin pig nose style power socket and plug were not getting good connection, even after being cleaned. And it was impossible to tell if ordering a new socket or plug would cure the situation as I didn't know which one or maybe both was worn out. Uh, and besides, these parts are difficult to find and expensive when you do find them. So I suggested we try this IEC style replacement that I found online. It's oriented in such a way that it will drop in most old Marshalls. Although a note on the listing mentions some chassis holes might need to be widened slightly. So I measured the hole in our chassis and this is one that might have to be widened slightly. I explained all this to the customer and I explained that for five bucks, it was worth seeing if we could shave the plug or minimally uh, shave the hole uh, to accommodate a new plug. So that's what we decided to do here. Okay, here we go. We're gonna bias this amplifier. I have already tried to bias it in a previous clip and uh, there was something wrong with the audio. So I'll just show you again what's going on. When I dial this thing up, let's go ahead and dial it up. We'll put about 60 something volts on here and let it start. We'll put about 75 volts. And we'll let these figures start coming up. So we're what we're doing is we're measuring the 
plate current over here on this <coughs> multimeter and we're measuring the plate voltage over here except I'm not because it's not it's not hooked up to ground let's fix that okay so again this is our plate voltage this is our plate current and over here you will probably won't be able to read it but up here in the corner is the input voltage and all that we're at 75 volts on the input we're going on 300 volts on the plate of the output and then we've got about 10 or so uh, milliamps of current we'll just kind of let this stabilize a little bit we'll go ahead and dial it on up though and I'll get to show you what it was doing so right here you can see we've got 48 milliamps 50 51 52 now the plate voltage will go down but not at a rate that prevents the overall wattage from continuing to, to go up as well. So the wattage is going up, the uh, amps draw overall for the amp, it just keeps inching upward. And right now we're at 60 milliamps, which is way too much. So we need to bring that down. Let's go ahead and do that for sure. Let's bring it back down here to about 36 or something for now and leave it for a second and let's see where that puts us so let's do a calculation here so 0 0.0382 times 486 is 18.56 a 6CA7 slash EL34 uh, slash in this case KT77 has a plate dissipation of about 25 watts per tube um, and if we take 70 percent of that 25 times 0 0.7 17 and a half watts so we need to lower it just a hair more to get that to about 70 percent And let's try this right here. So, 0 0.0345 times 490 volts equals 16.9. Now we can probably inch that up, back up just a smidgen. Just about 35 milliamps of current is going to get us exactly where we want to be. Uh, we can even dial it down slightly over here. That's got us right at 100 watts overall for the entire amp. And that's another way of uh, biasing an amplifier that a lot of people don't uh, recognize or really understand. Um, if you know what the overall wattage draw on an amplifier is supposed to or the overall dissipation on an amp is supposed to be uh, you can use that number to sort of get your bias in the ballpark so you can see right there that the power is right at 100 watts and that's with the output tubes pretty much dead on where we want them 0.91 amps right there so under an amp 120 volts dead on so even if we did not know what was going on with the output tubes and we had an exact, the exact same type of amp on the bench, we would be able to adjust the bias uh, based on getting it close to that 100 watt total. And it would probably be, if not spot on, it would be right in the ballpark. So it's just another way of doing it. I'm gonna let this burn for a little bit uh, just to make sure everything is okay. Um, we have uh, no, no input on this, which is where you wanna measure it. If I started putting a signal through it, these numbers would change. So you wanna always do this measurement at idle with nothing going through the amp. So yeah, I'm gonna monitor 
this for a little bit, probably over the next hour or so. I'll sort of monitor what's going on here, make sure the amp is operating as it should. And yeah, we'll be ready to pretty much wrap this up and give it a listen. 